Welcome to the Liver Transplant Patient Education class. This class was designed to help you learn more about the liver and the liver transplant process. Please have a pen and paper handy to write down any questions you may have. We invite you to be fully engaged during this class. Please take this time to silence your cell phone. Your liver. Not something you think about every day? Well, maybe you should. Found just under the rib cage on your right side, this incredible organ does more than you can imagine. Let's count down five things to love about your liver. At number five, it stops bleeding. If you find yourself saying, I am bleeding, your next words should be, seriously, I would like to stop bleeding now. No, seriously. Luckily, the liver creates proteins that help clot blood, which stops bleeding. Number four, your liver cleans your blood. Think of your liver like a giant sorting machine. It works all day and night to separate the good stuff like vitamins and nutrients from the bad stuff like alcohol, chemicals, from pesticides, pollution, and even cholesterol. Number three, give it up for bile. Bile is a juice that the liver makes that has two big jobs. It's crucial for digesting food and for getting rid of those nasty toxins. Once it leaves the liver, bile moves over to the gallbladder where it's stored until you poop it out. Without this function, you'd be in big trouble. Number two, your liver is a source of energy. It's kind of like a fueling station for the human body open 24 seven. And its main job is to maintain blood sugar levels. It works like this. You eat carbs, your body breaks down the carbs into glucose. Your liver grabs glucose and then stores it as glycogen. Your liver then breaks down that glycogen and releases sugar into your blood whenever you need energy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, something so outrageously cool about the liver that it boggles the mind. At number one, it regenerates. No other organ in the human body has a greater capacity to rebuild itself, even if up to 75% of it is diseased or removed. Liver disease can be inherited or caused by many different factors that damage the liver. Viruses such as hepatitis C or hepatitis B can infect the liver and cause it to become inflamed and make it difficult for the liver to do its job. Drinking lots of alcohol for many years can lead to liver disease. The more alcohol you drink, the more quickly you may develop liver disease. Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH for short, is also known as fatty liver disease. Risk factors for NASH include obesity, diabetes, and malnutrition. Liver failure can be caused by an autoimmune disease, a disease in which your immune system attacks certain parts of your body. Examples of autoimmune liver disease include autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, PBC, or primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC. An abnormal gene inherited from one or both of your parents can cause various substances to build up and damage your liver. Genetic liver diseases include hemochromatosis and Wilson's disease. Cryptogenic cirrhosis is the end stage of a chronic liver disease in which we don't know the underlying cause. Cirrhosis is a slowly developing disease in which healthy liver tissue is replaced with scar tissue. Each time your liver is injured, whether by disease, excessive alcohol consumption, or other cause, it tries to repair itself. In the process, deposits of fat lead to liver enlargement. Over time, scar tissue forms. As cirrhosis progresses, more and more scar tissue forms. The liver shrinks and hardens, making it difficult for the liver to do its job. Cirrhosis is irreversible and life-threatening. Patients with cirrhosis are at higher risk to develop liver cancer. It's very important to have radiology scans every six months, such as an ultrasound, CT scan, or MRI, as surveillance for liver cancer, so that the necessary treatment may be started as soon as possible. Some of the most common signs that your liver might be failing include 
extreme tiredness or fatigue. A damaged liver is unable to remove ammonia and other toxins from the body, which leads to confusion. This condition is called encephalopathy, and it causes trouble thinking, concentrating, and remembering things. If it worsens, it can lead to a coma. A healthy liver helps the body maintain fluid balance. Otherwise, fluid will build up in unwanted places, such as the belly. Fluid in the belly is referred to as ascites. You may also develop fluid buildup in the legs and ankles, known as edema. If the liver is severely damaged, a yellow compound called bilirubin will accumulate. This will cause jaundice, or yellowing of the skin and the eyes. A generalized itching sensation that can be constant or come and go. Tendency to bruise and bleed easily. People with severe liver disease may develop dilated blood vessels in the esophagus, called varices. These are prone to bleeding, which can lead to vomiting blood or blood in the stools. Not everyone with cirrhosis needs a liver transplant. If you do have cirrhosis, you may need a liver transplant if you have a risk of dying from your liver disease. If your liver disease is impacting your quality of life and there are no medical or surgical alternatives that would have a better outcome. Doctors will determine whether a liver transplant is the best treatment option for you. Some of the many benefits of transplantation include increased life expectancy, improved quality of life, and a regained sense of independence. Please note that transplantation is a treatment option and will not necessarily cure the underlying cause of your liver disease. Today you'll hear about the MELD score, which stands for Model for End-Stage Liver Disease. The MELD score is a scoring system used for prioritizing candidates on the liver transplant waiting list. It's based on a statistical formula using particular lab values. The MELD score is designed to predict who needs a liver transplant most urgently. The MELD score ranges from 6 to 40. A MELD of 6 indicates the liver is functioning well. The higher the score, the higher the chance a person will die from their liver disease within the next three months. A person with a MELD score of 40 likely will not survive much longer without a transplant. Before you're placed on the waiting list, you'll undergo a transplant evaluation, which is a series of tests and consults. Through the evaluation process, you'll learn more about our transplant center and we'll learn more about you. You will also learn more about liver disease, the transplant process, and what it takes to have a successful outcome. You will meet members of the transplant team. Your transplant coordinator will meet with you to review your medical history and answer your questions. You will have a surgical consultation with a transplant surgeon. The surgeon will discuss the risks and benefits of transplant with you, review your medical history, and determine whether transplant is the best treatment option for you. You'll have a consult with a transplant hepatologist or liver specialist. You will also meet with our transplant dietitian, a transplant social worker, and in some cases, a psychologist. You will also be scheduled for a variety of tests and screenings. You will have lab tests to include drug, alcohol, hepatitis, and HIV screening. You may be asked to complete a six minute walk test, a grip strength test, and a short physical performance battery test to help determine your current functional and frailty status. If your results are poor, or you are unable to complete the tests, you may need rehabilitation services or lung testing. You'll be scheduled for radiology testing. Your coordinator will also recommend that you update your vaccines and have routine tuberculosis screening. You'll have pulmonary or lung testing. We'll also test your heart to make sure that it's healthy enough to undergo a liver transplant surgery. You may also be asked to have a colonoscopy screening. 
females will need to have a mammogram and pap smear or pelvic exam. Males over the age of 40 will have a PSA drawn, which is a lab test that screens for prostate abnormalities. It's important to understand that the majority of the evaluation is required to be done at University Hospital in San Antonio. It'll be scheduled over about two to three days. We don't offer assistance for transportation or lodging. If you have concerns about expenses, time or travel, please notify your coordinator in advance to avoid canceling or rescheduling. Compliance is a huge factor in determining if you're a good candidate for transplant. We'll observe your compliance throughout the transplant process, including abstaining from alcohol and or drugs, your willingness to complete the evaluation in a timely manner, and your continued compliance after you're on the transplant waiting list, such as keeping your transplant clinic appointments, following the proper diet, and taking your medications as prescribed. Patients with advanced liver disease or patients with underlying kidney disease may require a combined liver kidney transplant. These patients will be on the waiting list for both organs and are usually offered both organs at the time of transplant. In rare cases, only one organ will be offered and the patient will remain on the list for the other organ until the other organ offer becomes available. If it's determined that you should be evaluated for a combined liver kidney transplant, your coordinator will also schedule a nephrology consult and an ultrasound of your kidneys as part of your transplant evaluation. Priority on the transplant list for a combined liver kidney transplant will depend on the MELT score. The higher the MELT score, the higher the priority for transplant. Patients on the liver kidney transplant list will require updates of the MELT score labs as well as labs, known as PRA, for the kidney waiting list. If you are placed on the liver kidney transplant list, please notify your coordinator immediately if you change dialysis centers. If you're not on dialysis and you start dialysis, notify your coordinator right away. If you are on dialysis and you're taken off dialysis, also notify your coordinator. Your transplant team is here to support you and guide you through the transplant process. Now let's learn more. Each patient is assigned a transplant coordinator who will be your primary point of contact for anything related to transplant. Your transplant coordinator will work with you and your family to help you understand the transplant process. A coordinator's job is to guide you through the transplant evaluation and answer any questions you may have. Your transplant surgeon will further evaluate your condition and review treatment options. If you're approved for a transplant, a transplant surgeon will perform the operation. A hepatologist specializes in diagnosing and treating patients with liver disease. He or she will examine your medical and physical history, closely monitor your symptoms, and work with you to decide the best treatment options. A social worker will ensure you have a healthy support system, including a dedicated caregiver. He or she will also discuss insurance coverage and fundraising options. While waiting for a transplant and during recovery, it's important to follow a balanced diet and stay as healthy as you can. Your dietitian will help you determine which foods you should be eating and how much. He or she will provide further recommendations for your diet. Because it is very important for you and your family to understand your insurance coverage and benefits information, you may be scheduled to meet with a transplant financial coordinator. Your transplant pharmacist may meet with you to discuss the medications you take, including over-the-counter medicine, and help prepare you for the new medications you'll need after transplant. Undergoing a liver transplant is a big step. If it is warranted, a psychologist will work with you and your family to cope with any emotional stress you're dealing with. He or she will also be looking for possible mental health issues that need to be addressed before and after your transplant. We have a dedicated and experienced transplant clinic staff. Our operating room team specializes 
in transplant surgery. After your transplant surgery, your discharge nurse will follow you closely during your hospital stay until you are discharged. Whether you're receiving a liver transplant from a deceased or living donor, members of University Health System's Transplant Center are by your side every step of the way and will support you through your entire journey. You are the most important member of this transplant team. We will also work very closely with your primary care doctor, gastroenterologist, your family and loved ones. The Transplant Selection Committee, which includes the transplant surgeons, hepatologists, nurse coordinators, social workers, dietitians, radiologists, and procurement team, meets weekly. Every patient's case is discussed during these meetings, at which time their evaluation results are reviewed to determine whether there are any issues which need to be further addressed before the patient can be placed on the liver or combined liver transplant waiting list. You'll be notified in writing of the committee's decision. One of three potential decisions will be made. The patient meets criteria and is approved to be listed. The patient does not meet criteria and cannot be listed. Or more information is needed to make a determination and the decision is deferred until the additional information can be obtained. Some patients cannot be evaluated or listed for a liver transplant if there are any of the following findings. HIV or AIDS cancer occurring outside of the liver, advanced heart and lung disease, uncontrolled infection in the body, active drinking or substance abuse. Our transplant center has a strict six months abstinence policy. You will be randomly tested for drugs and alcohol, even if your primary disease is not related to drugs or alcohol. If at any time your drug or alcohol tests are positive, we will automatically stop the transplant evaluation. If you are already on the waiting list, you will be placed on hold and may be removed from the waiting list. If you're approved for listing, your evaluation test will be sent to your insurance company for transplant surgery approval. After your insurance approves the surgery, your coordinator will contact you and ask you to have lab work done to calculate your current MELD score and place you on the waiting list. Once you are on the waiting list, you'll be notified in two ways. Your coordinator will call you on the phone and send you a letter by mail. United Network for Organ Sharing is a private nonprofit organization that is under contract by the federal government. It manages the National Transplant Waiting List, matches donors to recipients, and monitors every organ match and transplant to ensure patients receive healthy organs as they become available. During your transplant evaluation, and once you're on the waiting list, you have the following rights. You have the right to be placed on more than one transplant list, which means you can remain on our transplant list and be duly listed. You can be evaluated by another transplant center and transfer your care without loss of accrued waiting time. You have the right to withdraw agreement for transplantation at any time during the process. The alternative medical treatments available to you is medical management by your doctor, or you may be kept comfortable through palliative treatment. UNOS provides a toll-free patient services line to help transplant candidates, recipients, and family members understand organ allocation practices and the transplant data. You may also call this number to discuss a problem you may be experiencing with your transplant center or the transplant system in general. Toll-free patient services line is 1-888-894-6361. All patients on the waiting list are required to attend a pre-operative transplant education class. You'll learn more about the transplant process, what to expect while you're in the hospital after being called in, and how to take care of your organ after your transplant. Stay as healthy as you can. The healthier you are when you're transplanted, the faster you'll recover and the better outcomes you'll have. It's your responsibility to keep in touch with your transplant coordinator. Notify us of any telephone, address, or insurance changes. Notify us when you'll be out of town or unavailable to be called in for transplant. Let us know of any changes in your health and if you're hospitalized or applying for hospice services. 
You're responsible to keep up with the regular follow-up visits in our transplant clinic. Provide your coordinator with any new test results or records that are requested, including yearly radiology exams, mammogram, pap smear, and vaccine records. It's very important to keep your vaccines up to date to reduce the risk of transmissible diseases and infections. You're also responsible for updating your MELD labs, as required, to maintain your place on the waiting list. If your labs are not received by the due date, you will automatically drop down to the bottom of the waiting list until we receive your lab results. Please remember that our center will only provide prescription refills for medications prescribed by our providers. Refills take three to four business days to be approved and called into your pharmacy, so please plan accordingly. For your convenience, University Health System offers a patient portal at myuhs.com where you may view your health information such as lab results, update your personal information, view your account details, and pay your balance online. Every year, many thousands of people receive the gift of life, a life-saving transplant of a heart, kidney, liver, lungs, pancreas, or intestines. And thousands more people receive corneas and other tissues that restore sight and health. Transplantation is one of the great medical advances of our time. How does it work? It all starts when someone's organ begins to fail, and that person will need a transplant to survive. A thorough evaluation is conducted at a transplant center, and if the person's a good candidate for a transplant, he or she will be put on the National Transplant Waiting List. Once a person is on the list, the wait for an organ begins. A national system matches people on the waiting list with donors. The factors considered in matching donors and recipients include blood type and body size, how sick the patient is, distance from the donor, tissue type, and length of time on the waiting list. What doesn't get taken into account? Organs are never matched based on race or gender. Income, celebrity, and social status are also never considered in matching donor organs to waiting patients. There's no telling how long the wait will take. In fact, some people don't receive an organ in time because the waiting list is very long and there aren't enough donors available. That's why an average of 18 people on the waiting list die each day. Imagine how many we could save if we all were donors. Most organs for transplants come from deceased donors. Here's how that happens. A person comes to the hospital with a life-threatening brain injury, such as from an accident, a stroke, or lack of oxygen. The doctors work hard to save the patient's life, but sometimes nothing can be done. There's a complete, irreversible loss of brain function. The patient is clinically and legally dead. That's when being a donor can turn a time of loss into a time of hope. Because machines have kept blood containing oxygen flowing to the organs, they can be passed along. One person can give life to as many as eight people through organ donation and enhance the lives of 50 people or more through eye and tissue donation. But now, minutes matter. Matches must be found and transplants must happen quickly. The hospital contacts an organ procurement organization, an OPO. OPOs manage the organ recovery process. The OPO checks the state organ donor registry. If the person is already registered as a donor, they'll inform the family. If not, they'll ask the family to authorize donation. A medical examination takes place. They check the medical and social history. And if the person is eligible to be an organ donor, the computer begins the search on the national waiting list for well-matched patients. The best matched patients for each organ are contacted by their transplant teams. This is the call that every single person on the waiting list has been hoping for. The call that could mean a second chance at life. Now the transplant happens. A surgical team recovers the organs, then corneas and other tissues. The organs are sent to the transplant hospitals where the patients and transplant teams are waiting and the life-saving transplants take place. It will take healthy living and medications to keep the organ working well in its new home. 
But some wonderful person has given the most precious gift of all, the gift of life. You too can make the decision today to sign up on your state registry as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Any age is the right age, young or old. And any day is the right day to sign up as a donor. You can register through your driver's license office, or you can sign up right now, online. Remember to tell your family so they can support your wishes. More than 100 million people have already signed up, but we're all needed to save more lives. Go to organdonor.gov and sign up in your state donor registry as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Go to organdonor.gov and share the gift of life. Once you're placed on the waiting list, be ready to be called in for transplant at any time, day or night. When an organ becomes available for you, the transplant coordinator on call only has a short window of time to reach you before the offer must move on to the next person on the waiting list. Have your phone or cell phone handy, powered on and charged at all times. We may call at unexpected times. Keep in mind that there's a chance a transplant may be canceled at any point for a variety of reasons after you've been called in while you're on your way to University Hospital or after you arrive at the hospital. Be prepared to leave your house within a few minutes after receiving the call. Have a backpack at all times with a list of emergency contacts and important phone numbers. You should also pack items you'll want to bring with you to the hospital. For your comfort, you're encouraged to bring loose-fitting clothing, slippers, a robe, and toiletries. Your caregiver should also prepare by packing clothing and other items they may need while they wait through the surgery and are with you after your surgery. Bring your photo ID, insurance, and prescription cards. You should also bring your medical power of attorney and living will. Bring your medications and your medication list with you to the hospital. Your caregiver should also bring these items for themselves. We're not allowed to share any donor information with the recipient or their loved ones. We're protecting the donor and the donor's family right to privacy through their agreement for donation. We cannot share their age, gender, cause of death, or location of the donor. We request that you respect the donor family's right to privacy and not ask any medical staff any identifying information of the donor. You will be listed as accepting organ offers from increased risk donors. If you're offered an organ from a donor that is considered to be an increased risk from that of a standard donor, these risks will be explained to you. You have the right to decline an offer from an increased risk donor without penalty. Some of the types of increased risk organ offers include donation after circulatory death, which is the recovery of organs after the blood stops circulating in the body. Split liver. The donor liver is split in two and the larger portion will go to the adult and the smaller portion will go to a child on the waiting list. You may be placed on the transplant list as willing to accept organ offers from hepatitis C positive and hepatitis C NAP positive donors. You will contract hepatitis C but will be treated, there are advanced hepatitis C treatments that have incredible success rates. Your hepatitis C will be treated after the transplant surgery. All patients will be listed as accepting hepatitis B core antibody positive organ offers. The physicians of the transplant center have found the increased occurrence of false positives for this test. The transplant center has determined that the risk of developing hepatitis B is much lower than the risk of death on the waiting list. If you are hepatitis B antibody positive and are on hepatitis B treatment, you will be listed as willing to accept organ offers from hepatitis B NAP positive donors. It is the patient's responsibility to remain up to date with their hepatitis B vaccines and booster shots. Every kidney offered for a transplant will have a kidney donor profile index score, which ranges from 0 to 100. If you are on the combined liver kidney transplant waiting list, you may be offered a deceased donor kidney with a KDPI score of greater than 
which is associated with the kidneys likely to function the shortest amount of time, but is considered a good match for you by the medical team. The PHS guideline was set in place to improve organ transplant recipient outcomes by reducing the risk of HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C virus transmission, keeping in mind that transplantation can never be free of this risk. A donor will be classified as a PHS increased risk donor if the donor meets one or more of the PHS guideline criteria, which will be provided to you in the liver combined liver kidney transplant recipient acknowledgement form. We accept organs from these donors when our transplant physicians have determined the benefit outweighs the potential risk and with the consent of the patient. If you choose to accept this organ, you will be monitored for several months so that we can be sure that no transmission occurred. A liver transplant surgery lasts approximately six to eight hours. The average hospital stay is seven to 10 days, two to three days in the transplant ICU. Your hospital care will be overseen by our multidisciplinary transplant team. One of the highest risks associated with transplant, especially during the first three months after transplant, is rejection. Your immune system will not recognize the transplanted organ and will attack it like it would a bacteria or a virus. There is also a chance that the transplanted organ may not function well immediately or at all because of technical factors or other complications. You will take immunosuppressant or anti-rejection medications for the lifetime of your transplanted organ, which will protect your transplanted organ from your body's immune system. If you don't take your medications properly, you will reject your new liver. If your liver fails because you were not taking your medication properly, you will not be considered for another transplant. Signs of rejection are similar to those of infection. Transmissible diseases. The donor organ is thoroughly examined and tested by the organ bank for transmissible diseases. However, there is still a risk that donor-associated tumors, genetic diseases, and or transmissible diseases, including, but not limited to, HIV, hepatitis C, and hepatitis B may not be identified until after transplantation and may be transmitted to you. Bleeding that may require blood transfusion, surgical complications, respiratory complications or breathing problems, complications related to your post-transplant medications. The anti-rejection medications weaken your immune system so you will be at risk for infection and cancer. Diabetes may be caused by the medications that are given to you after transplant to prevent rejection. They may also cause high blood pressure. Your kidneys may be affected by the post-transplant medications or traumatized by the surgery. Reinfection of original disease, such as hepatitis B and C or autoimmune hepatitis, which may recur and may lead to recurrent cirrhosis. These viruses have been shown to be more aggressive after transplant. Psychosocial risks, including financial stressors, caregiver burnout, loss of support, emotional or psychiatric disturbance, which may include guilt, resentment, depression, PTSD, or generalized anxiety. As with any surgery, there is always the risk of death before during or after the transplant surgery. The SRTR, which stands for Scientific Registry for Transplant Recipients, is the world's largest transplant database, which analyzes transplant data to determine survival rates among other data to ensure transplantation continues to improve. Copies of updated SRTR data will be provided to you. This data is published every six months and is available for your review at www dot srtr dot org. You may be asked by a transplant team member to volunteer to take part in a research study for transplant medications, liver disease, and other studies. 
In the United States, there are about 15,000 people waiting for livers. The thing that is always going to be the roadblock is how many donors do we have. And so anything we can do to increase that would be a terrific boon to decreasing the number of people waiting. Living donation is certainly one of those things. Well, a lot of times people have the notion that they don't want a family member to be a donor. Our biggest barrier to donation is people hate to ask for help. Very often what we see our patients say is, no, they don't want anyone to do that for them. So our hardest thing about living donation is getting our recipients, the ones who actually need the transplant, to spread the word. The way the liver transplant list works is the sickest patients are at the top of the list and have priority. So the patients who are not as ill have to wait till they're much sicker before they have the option of transplant. So a living donor allows them to have the transplant before they're extremely sick, which saves them frequently a great deal of time in and out of the hospital. Our goal with living donation is always to protect the donor. We'll take no chances with their health and recovery. If you have a donor, and they might be relatives, they might be friends, they might be church members. They will go through the same workup that somebody that will be a recipient will go through. Typically, for a living donor liver transplant, we take out the right 60% of the liver. The liver is very unique in that it's able to regenerate. And within the first month to nine months, the right lobe in the recipient grows to the normal size of the liver, and the left lobe in the donor increases in size back to its original size. We have spent a lot of time trying to help educate our patients, not just to the importance of finding a living donor, but how to go about finding a living donor. Our patients tell me all the time, they're like, I don't want to ask someone. And frankly, I wouldn't want to have to ask someone for an organ either. But I think really what it goes to is not so much asking people to donate to you, but being very open and honest. Those people who are interested in being donors, that's all they need is they need the opportunity to hear about it. They'll figure out to come forward on their own. They don't need to be directly asked. If you also talk to donors, they are incredible individuals, heroes to me. They literally want to do everything they can to make life better for somebody else. And they're completely unselfish about what they have to go through. And after you ask them, well, was this worth it? And they go, doctor, it was not only worth it, it's made me a better person. This is my dad, Paul Maldonado, and I became a living liver donor for him. I just really appreciate what you did. You're my angel. You saved my life. The living donors who I've come to know, and many, many of whom I've operated on, almost uniformly felt this was an extremely positive experience for them. They feel very good that they helped someone they cared about. I think it's like a lot of altruistic giving in life that applies to many things. Giving is very special and makes the giver feel very good. This is my son, Jeremy Garcia, and I became a liver donor because of him, the love of my life. You don't have to go ask. People are asking you. And instead of saying no, you just need to change your answer and you need to say, oh my gosh, that overwhelms me so much. I'm just so touched that you asked. And here's how you find out more information. Hello, welcome to the nutrition portion of the liver transplant patient education class. We'll be discussing some general nutrition recommendations related to liver disease and transplantation. As part of your transplant evaluation, you will have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a registered dietitian, at which time you'll receive more specific recommendations. Please write down your questions. We will answer them for you during your one-on-one -on -one consultation. Now that you have a pen and paper handy, Let's get started. Why is good nutrition so important? I thought I was just here to talk about transplant. That's an excellent question. We want you to have the best nutrition possible prior to transplant. Our objective as dietitians is to have you on the best diet possible to help your body prevent muscle wasting, improve wound healing, reduce or prevent fluid retention, and obtain an appropriate body mass index, or BMI, for transplant. Here is a brief summary of our recommendations. 
During your one-on-one -on -one consultation, your dietitian may recommend having four to six small portion meals daily instead of your typical three meals per day that you may be used to. Again, this will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, so your dietitian will provide the appropriate recommendations during your one-on-one -on -one consultation. You should not consume more than 2,000 milligrams of sodium or salt in one day. You should follow a low-salt diet. We do recommend a high-protein diet. We'll discuss good proteins in just a moment. It's important to avoid skipping meals. During your one-on-one -on -one consultation, your dietitian may also recommend having a small bedtime snack. Try to include two to three of the following items on your plate at each of your meals. Two to three servings of vegetables, one to two servings of whole grains, one to two servings of fruit, and two to three ounces of lean protein. You mentioned a low salt diet. How much salt is low salt? We recommend that you limit your sodium or salt intake to 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day. You can divide 2,000 by the number of meals you have in the day. For example, if you're having four small portion meals per day, you can divide 2,000 by four, which would give you 500 milligrams of sodium per meal. You don't have to count the sodium throughout the day. We can show you ways to make substitutions to follow a low sodium diet. Too much sodium can make you feel thirsty, cause fluid weight gain, and even lead to high blood pressure. Salt is mostly sodium, so it's important to learn how to reduce the amount of salt in your diet. Here are some tips to help you stay healthy and shake off the salt. Eating smarter begins with shopping smarter. Shop the outer aisles of the grocery store or visit your local farmer's markets to choose fresh foods. Fresh is best, and there are many great foods to choose. Forget fast foods. If you do treat yourself to fast food, do it in moderation and remember your portion sizes. Discover bold flavors by selecting spices. There are lots of ways to make food tasty. Instead of salt, Try big, bold spices like paprika, chili powder, rosemary, garlic powder, or basil. Learn the lingo and read the label. There's a whole special language of nutritional information. And the more you know it, the better you'll be able to shake off the salt. Choose foods with a percentage daily value of less than 10% for sodium. Also, choose sodium-free or low-sodium foods. Foods that are labeled reduced sodium or light in sodium can still be high in sodium or high in potassium, so always check the nutrition facts. Consuming less sodium makes you feel less thirsty, helps you retain less fluid, and improves your health. Good protein sources would be high protein foods that are lower in salt, which include milk, milk powder, and soy milk, cheese, such as Swiss, ricotta, and low-sodium cottage. Yogurt. Canned fish and water. Eggs. Unsalted nuts. Dried legumes. Fresh meat and fish. And unsalted peanut butter. During your one-on-one -on -one nutrition consultation, you may be recommended to consume a bedtime snack. Examples of healthy bedtime snacks include a peanut butter sandwich using unsalted peanut butter, a glass of milk and slice of toast, a glass of milk and cup of fruit, a smoothie or nutrition supplement, such as Boost or Ensure. If a nutrition supplement is already part of your diet, please let your dietitian know during your one-on-one -on -one consultation. Other great bedtime snacks include fresh fruit with unsalted peanut butter or yogurt with fresh fruits. 
it's highly recommended that you try to avoid processed foods, salted nuts or peanut butter, frozen meals, canned foods, any type of salt, cured foods, fried food, and fast food. We'll teach you how to find healthy substitutions for foods that you should avoid. That's a great list of foods I should not eat. Can you give me some examples of food that I should be eating? Absolutely. It's best to eat home-cooked meals. Use Mrs. Dash or equivalent to season your foods. You may also use individual herbs and spices, lime juice, lemon juice, and peppers. Try making homemade casseroles. Choose fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables, eggs, fresh or frozen fish and chicken, and milk, yogurt, and cheese. Will I have to follow the same diet even after transplant? Not quite. During your hospital stay after your transplant surgery, you'll receive more nutrition education. Recommendations will be slightly different because they are based on the medications you'll be taking after you are transplanted. Here's an overview of the nutrition recommendations you will probably receive after your transplant surgery. Generally, it is recommended that you have three well-balanced meals per day. Follow a heart-healthy diet, which includes low salt and low fat. You should avoid concentrated sweets, such as soda and juice. Due to medication interactions, you should avoid all grapefruit and pomegranate. It's important to read the labels, as grapefruit and pomegranate extracts are sometimes unexpectedly found in food or drinks. We'll teach you some food safety guidelines. Since your immune system is suppressed after transplant, it's important to follow these recommendations closely. Is there anything else you recommend to help me prepare for transplant? Stay active. It is extremely important that you remain active before and after transplant. Exercise of any type is a great way to shape up and stay in shape. You should aim to exercise approximately 150 minutes per week. Check with your physician before starting any exercise regimen to ensure there are no contraindications. Thank you for allowing the University Health System to participate in your transplant care. We look forward to working with you.